Season one of The Fairer Sense is sponsored by FreshBooks, the cloud accounting software for small business owners and freelancers who are out there being general business badasses. Stay tuned for more info on how you can get a free trial. Thanks, FreshBooks. I'm Kara. I'm Tanya. And this is The Fairer Sense. Rad women and real money stories instead of the same old financial bullshit. Today we're talking about changing the definition of success. Hey Tanya. Hey Kara. How are you? I'm not going to lie. I'm I'm good, but I'm a little tired. <laughs> That's real. It is. Yeah, it's it is the home stretch to our early retirement. I have as of this moment 10 work days to go when we're recording and there is still a bit on my to-do list, although I was looking today and realized there's a ton that we have crossed off this year, like crammed on medical care, crammed on a ton of like housekeeping and bookkeeping type things we needed to get in order. But there are still a few things that I got to scramble and do before we say goodbye to our careers. So it's just a little overwhelming at the moment. How about you? How are you doing? I'm in awe of you. I'm not going to lie. You have been <laughs> busting your butt for months at this point. You've really been going full front on both the blog and the podcast and at your your real job. <laughs> it's very impressive. And I'm good. I don't know. I'm kind of oscillating between like everything's terrible and everything's amazing. It's a very weird place to be right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in this moment, I am doing really well. I completely feel that. And I'm glad that at this moment, you're doing well. And you know that if you're ever not, you can say that here. Safe space. Safe space. Yes, I do feel like I can be really honest with you and with our listeners and just with this microphone that I love so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which, and uh, Sidebar, oh. sometime can we have a chat about how phallic all microphones are and how awkward it is when I'm having conversations with women for this podcast and I'm shoving this like penis in their face. <laughs> Talking to the penis. Talk to the penis, ladies. <laughs> um, yes, bonus episode coming up. Um, <laughs> yes, but it is, it is funny to me how much I enjoy – recording by myself in my office, just talking into the microphone. I'm like, nobody hears this. It's just me by myself. And then it gets broadcast to so many people. It's kind of silly. I don't like spend a lot of time in life dwelling on things that I could have done differently. Like I don't feel like I have like a long list of regrets. I joke, but I'm not totally joking that like my real regret in life is not seeing the chili peppers when Frushante played with them. (laughs) Oh my God. Uh, I know. But One of the things that I just really wish I could go back in time and do is get recordings of when in high school I did late night jazz DJ volunteer work at the local public radio station. And it was like 10 to midnight on Friday nights and it was me alone in this studio inside like a dark building on a kind of lonely commuter college campus and like talking to the world. And it was so funny. Like sometimes older guys would call and it was a little creepy and they'd want to just like chat with me. And I was doing my best to like talk in my lowest register and sound older, (laughs) which I'm sure just sounded like I was trying to do like phone sex voice or something. (laughs) But I'm so curious what I said because it was exactly what you're talking about. It was like I felt like it was this like safe cocoon where it was just me talking to the microphone and like I'm dying to know. Like I'm sure there was some ridiculous like teen angst pretending to be like grown up and mature. Plus I was talking about jazz, which is like so hilarious that this like 17-year-old white girl in Wisconsin <laughs> like professed to know anything about jazz. But anyway, there you go. That's like something I wish I could like go back and revisit or at least hear some recordings, but it's all lost to the sands of time. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's so funny to hear that because I know you love radio and I know you have a real passion for this, but I'm like, no, but you have a passion for this to be doing. Oh, yeah. Jazz oh, yeah. radio at 17 from 10 to midnight on Fridays. Oh my gosh. That's it was a social life killer. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, but it was also like I just basically went to the public radio station and was like, I will do anything. What can I do? And it was like once they needed a sub desperately and they're like, uh, could you do it? I was like, Yes, <laughs> I will do anything. <laughs> I will file your invoices. <laughs> That's that's beautiful. That really is. Yeah. Baby Tanya, it was pretty funny. But I I will always cherish that. It was great. 
Oh my gosh. What is great about your life right now? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, you just heard too much about radio. (laughs) The thing that I am really grateful for at the moment is actually guys, um, specifically progressive, open-minded guys who are really listening at this moment we're in right now, like the Me Too moment. And the number of my guy friends, including Oliver, who you guys heard on the podcast last week on episode five about privilege, just hearing folks really bringing a new level of awareness to kind of like what women have always put up with, like the SNL song from this weekend, Welcome to Hell. Like, yeah, like this has always been the hell. You're just like now aware of it. But I really am appreciating how many guys are actually opening their eyes and opening their ears and really listening in a genuine way. On one hand, it's like, what took all so long? But this is totally a moment for me of like better late than never. And also like, thank goodness. Like it's so gratifying to hear people listening and I think in some cases speaking up And that's really what we need. Like whether this moment changes people who are sexual predators or sexual harassers or not, like I'm sort of dubious about that. But if it gets us more allies and emboldens them to speak up so that we're not always the ones having to carry the burden of shutting that stuff down, like I think that that would ultimately be a huge positive for all of us. So I'm totally grateful. Thank you guys. Seconded allies forever. And yeah, kind of along that note, it's like you can have this really honest conversation with people in your life, some people in your life that you couldn't before where you can share, hey, these are experiences I've had. These are experiences lots of people have had. And it's it's sometimes not always great. (laughs) You don't really want to be talking Mm -hmm. about the serial sexual harassment you've experienced, but it is kind of relieving to have an honest conversation. And that's something I'm feeling really grateful for. I was having a conversation with a friend via text just earlier today, and it was super honest. And I felt really, really supported in the conversation. And I've had another conversation with a friend recently where we've just both been really upfront about stuff that's happening in our lives and how we feel about it and how we feel about each other. And it was amazing. And it wasn't even super heavy. It was just kind of like, yeah, man, I'm like so glad I know you. And sometimes shit's tough, but sometimes shit's awesome. (laughs) And I'm just so glad that I know people that I can have these open, honest, intimate, somewhat deep conversations with on a Tuesday. (laughs) Yeah, that's so great. I'm so glad that you feel like you're getting that. I think that's something that everybody needs, but not everyone has that social circle or has the feeling with friends or family like they can speak on that level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a special thing and I'm feeling grateful for it. I mean, like Kara, you're definitely someone who keeps it real, which I think everyone listening knows by now. But do you have any tips for folks or tips for, say, your co-host who has been traveling for work so much in recent years that she's sort of like let her social life at home actually slide far too much. Um, Like what, what do you think helps enable those really honest conversations? Like, is there anything that you would advise folks to do? I think if you want someone to be honest with you, you have to be honest with them. So I always offer up myself and whether it's struggles or highlights I try to be really frank sometimes. You know, I've told people I'm making X amount of money. I've also told people like, yeah, you know, I'm not particularly close with my siblings. And that allows people to say, oh yeah, kind of same or, oh, that's a bummer (laughs) or whatever. So I feel like you just need to put yourself out there if you're going to ask someone else to go out there. And I also think Mm -hmm. it's a consistency thing. I mean, I don't know if you've read those articles about how hard it is to make friends in your 30s, but (laughs) it's... It's very real. You don't necessarily have a long history with someone, so they might feel like they don't want to open up to you or they don't trust you as much as they do the person they've known for 15 years. So I think if you have a really great conversation with someone or a really great hang, making sure to follow up and do that again and again and again, that really builds a rapport with people. They welcome you into their inner circle and into their life and you get to know them in a more intimate way. Yeah, that's totally great. So yeah, here's to honesty. Here's to honesty. So today we're talking about success and really all the stuff that goes into it. So it's not just sort of like the rah-rah entrepreneur stuff, but the pressure that we feel to achieve success, how we define success, and whether that definition and that pressure are things that we put on ourselves or whether that's pressure that society puts on us and how all of this stuff fits together. 
Yeah, I think the definition of success, I think there's a broad picture definition of success where we're like, you know, have a lot of money, dress really well, you should be able to afford a lot of things, you should look a certain way. And I think a lot of that is ridiculous. (laughs) And a lot of it is, Mm -hmm. it feels like, or it is presented as one size fits all. And it's really not. There's a lot of nuances to success. There's a lot of people who reject the traditional definition of success and are carving out their own paths. And I consider myself one of them. And I think that it's important to take a good hard look at what you want for yourself and what you consider success in your own life. Yeah. And I think like when we think about success, I think success by itself is sort of a hollow thing. It really can take on a number of different meanings. And I think a lot of folks are really focused on the outward definition of what is success supposed to look like and how can I project that image. I always think about the scene in American Beauty when Annette Benning and Peter Gallagher, is that his name? The king of real estate. When they're talking about to be successful, you have to project an image of success. Like I do think that there is absolutely that narrative out there. But I think we should all be asking ourselves how we define success personally and what the substance of that is. So not just like what other people think of us, but what is the meaning that we derive? So I think like in in my most recent years, I've really focused on that of like, what is it that I can do to make my life most meaningful and not necessarily just like have the coolest stories or sound the most impressive to people, which I think for a lot of my life was my definition of success. And so I think not just thinking about the word itself, but like what it actually means to you and what content is inside of that notion of success. Yeah, I love the way you just phrased that. What content is inside that notion of success? What are you doing? What are the actions you're taking? Who are you hanging out with? What are you putting into the world and what are you taking out of it? For me, the definition of success has changed at different points in my life. I think that's natural. It happens to everyone. For a very long time, for me, success was getting into college and a very specific college. I knew where I wanted to go early on. And then it was, you know, pay off my student loan debt. And then it was write, just write literally anything. (laughs) And my definitions of success for me professionally, for me personally, for me financially have all changed and they're still continuing to grow and change and develop. That's a really interesting relationship to be in with yourself. And it's also really interesting to think about the ways I'm going about trying to get that. I have a blog. There's a lot of people who make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, a year off of their blog. And they do things that I don't want to do. And that's not, there's no shade. They do what's right for them. But I'm like, that's not right for me. That's not how I want to go about that. And that's fine. But that means my path to financial success is going to be different from theirs. Yeah, I love that. It's it's the point too that it's not just about ultimately what do you achieve, but what are you willing to do to achieve it? And I think that tends to have a connotation when you ask that question about like how hard are you willing to work? But I also think it's like, what are you not willing to do? There is a lot of stuff that some folks do to make money on blogs, for example, but you could apply this to any job or any money-making endeavor where like there's stuff you might do that makes you feel a little icky or that just doesn't quite sit right with you. And some folks are good with that and others aren't. And again, like no judgment. It's just a question of defining that for yourself. I also think with the big picture of success, there's not always a lot of room for transparency or vulnerability. And those are two really important things to me. I try to be really upfront and honest, as we heard earlier, (laughs) not just with my friends, but also on this podcast and in my blog and in my professional life. And it's important to me that I show the successes and that I also show my struggles and that I can pop onto Instagram and say, you know, I'm having a really tough week. (laughs) Like here's a picture of some flowers because they make me feel happy and I really need to feel happy right now. (laughs) And I don't always feel that there's space for that in the traditional narrative of success. And that bums me out. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that we're going to talk a little bit about with one of our guests today who is a friend of mine and a colleague of mine who I'll be chatting with in a bit. So for me, I think that there is not a specific definition, but there's a clear picture of what we think of as success, right? And a lot of that is tied up in money. We think of rich people as successful. We think of thin people as successful. We think of conventionally attractive people as successful. And I think when we think about success, it's having a lot of money, having a big house, having a fancy car, having these status symbols that we can show to other people and that we have access to. We should be able to go to the country club. We should be able to have the black Amex when we've 
quote unquote, made it. So again, it's not like a specific Webster dictionary definition, but there is a a distinct image that comes to mind when we think of a successful person. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things for me is how much my definition of success has changed over time, which frankly, I'm really grateful for because I think that I've been a person, as we kind of talked about in our episode on ambition, who has always had a pretty lofty vision of what I wanted to achieve in life. And it's at times led to some disappointments. And it's one of those things where now with a little bit more time behind me and a little bit more perspective, I realize was super unhealthy. And also that setting the bar too high really does steal joy from achievements. Like I really wanted to go to Harvard and I didn't ultimately get into Harvard, but I got a full ride to Berkeley, which is like freaking amazing. But at the time I was really focused on the fact that I didn't get into Harvard. And so it felt like I was going to a fallback option, which I just want to smack 17 year old me out of the public radio station. (laughs) And say, like, what is wrong with you? Like, this amazing thing just fell in your lap. And like, why are you not celebrating that as a complete victory? Because it totally was. But it's really that question to me of like, where do you set the bar? And then ultimately, what does that do for you? And I think something that I continue to struggle with is like, we don't want to set the bar too low in a way, right? Because we do want to push ourselves and we should have high expectations for ourselves if that's something that we want. And at the same time, though, it's that question of just setting the bar too high set us up for disappointment or set us up to not appreciate something that is still clearly a win. And I don't know if that's a universal question or if that's just something that especially ambitious folks tackle, but it is definitely something that has continually been on my mind for all these years. Yeah, it's a very fine line because you should be striving for Harvard, right? I never want to say to anyone, don't be ambitious, don't strive for success, whatever that means to you. Like work for Harvard, apply to Harvard, but if you don't get in, you do have to be able to find happiness elsewhere. You do have to be able to shift that definition of success. It's just a pivot. And again, it's always going to change. We change as people. We're not the same. I'm not the same person I was when I was nine. I'm not the same person I was when I was 19. I'm a totally new me. And (laughs) in five years, in 10 years, in 35 years, I'm going to be a totally new me all over again. And I'm going to want different things. And that's okay. That's good. It is good. And I think letting ourselves continue to evolve and continue to change those definitions is really important. The flip side of that, I think, is it's not always about just realizing that you want different things as you have different goals. I think for me at least, and I think for a lot of people I know, and frankly, a lot of the people who are pursuing early retirement, which is the niche that I blog in, there is definitely a sense of like, hey, I followed the conventional path. I did the stuff I was supposed to do. I worked hard. I wanted the big house. I wanted the fancy car. I wanted the corner office and the great title. And I will say in my case, like we didn't do the big house or the fancy car or the corner office. But like Mark and I have both definitely been really career focused people and have achieved pretty high levels in our careers and kind of realizing like those things are wonderful. And it is definitely gratifying on some level to continue to get promotions or to be recognized or to feel valued at work. And I would never say that that stuff isn't worthwhile, though I know some folks who focus on early retirement absolutely would. Um, They'd say that stuff is hollow and I think they're wrong. But it's not the end all be all. It's like, I think there tends to be this idea of like, oh, if I achieve this level, then I'll be happy or then I will feel like a success. And we've really found no level that we've ever achieved, no thing that we've ever acquired, no amount of money that we've ever seen in the bank has ever made us feel fundamentally different. Like the day we became financially independent was just another day. And it was cool. We're like, oh, cool. Like we hit this number. Yay. But then like moving on, it didn't mean that I didn't have to do the dishes or Mark didn't have to do the dishes, to be honest, um, or that I didn't have to let the dogs out or like do my work or any of that other stuff. And so I think there's that too, which I think like the most negative way to look at it would be to call it disillusionment. But I think it's less that. It's more just like as we continue to grow and mature and we realize that the things that we wanted aren't magic. Like it's still just life. And that I do think is really important to stay open to so that we can keep redefining our definitions of success there to maybe focus more on the meaning side and less on the outward signs of success. I talked with Erin Lowry, author of the blog Broke a Millennial and the book Broke a Millennial, Stop Scraping By and Get Your Financial Life Together, and actually the soon-to-be author of two new books, which is very exciting. So just words on words on words with Erin. 
Erin is a friend and she's also someone that I really admire and someone who I consider very successful. So I wanted to talk to her about her definitions of success and her experiences with both ambition and success. You might remember Erin from back in episode one when we interviewed a bunch of ladies about why women don't feel welcome in money conversations. So she's been featured here before. Maybe she'll be featured here again. (laughs) Anyway, here's my conversation with Erin. Unfortunately, I think much of the narrative that currently exists around women being successful is primarily defined by the patriarchy. But if you want to also just say it by like a traditional heteronormative cisgender male, specifically white male agenda, and just throw out all of those like $2 words just because. But I mean, honestly, I think you look at a lot of examples of success these days and you see these women who are powerhouses and what we traditionally describe as male dominated fields and whether like right now tech is hot. So we look at women like Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer and women who are getting to the upper echelons of those jobs, which are very traditionally male. And then not only are they traditionally male, but these women continue to adhere to job descriptions like their male counterparts, for example taking two weeks of maternity leave instead of like six or eight, it doesn't do us any good. And I don't want to flame throw another woman's decision because that's might have been what was best for her mental health and her family. But at the same time, now there's this script that, well, if she could do it, you can do it. It's like, yeah, she can do it because she's a multimillionaire who has a support system in place. It's not quite the same as a single mother of two living off of less than $30,000 a year. I feel like our framework of success is still largely defined by how we view successful men. It's like the idea of trickle-down success. Well, these men up at the top who have had everything in the world going for them were able to do it. <laughs> and like, you should be able to achieve it. But there's no nuance there. There's no accounting for different circumstances, like you said. And it's totally bonkers, in my opinion. The very classic Americana, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender. Like, there are certainly examples out there of people doing those things. But... They're, again, they're outliers. We can hold them up and we can look and try to prescriptively break down how they did what they did, but that doesn't mean it's a playbook that everyone else can follow. And you look at a lot of women that are up on the Fortune 500 type companies, and you know, I feel like we are also looking at people who started either like shapewear lines or makeup lines or things that, yeah, these are are women-focused things, and it's great that obviously a woman is leading that company, but I'd like to also see it more consistent that women are there in all different sectors. I heard with stat one time and couldn't tell you if it's credible or not, but that there are more CEOs named John on the Fortune 500 list than there are women entirely. I've heard that same stat. I'm yeah, not that's surprised. That's distressing. <laughs> like, I am 0% surprised. What are your own personal ambitions? Through a serendipitous series of events, so cue to me downplaying how the book came to be because I feel like women tend to do that. <laughs> um, but through a serendipitous series of events, I ended up with a book deal. And so it's interesting to me, that's a success metric that you're using, the fact that I have a book come out. I currently don't know that I consider myself successful with the one. I felt very proud that it came out. I had a really morbid thought at one point that I was like, well, if I die tomorrow, at least I have a legacy. And all I wanted from the book was not like... I didn't think I was going to get famous. My goal was to sell 10,000 copies. Like that was my big metric going in, which is pretty low in terms of book sales. 10,000 is by no means a runaway hit. And that was one thing I went into using that as a metric to define success. But what I really wanted was to hear from at least one person that my book made a difference. And I was like, if I can actually help someone outside of my own network, outside of people that I know read the blog, like if a random person gets this book in their hands and it changes something for them and betters their life, that's going to have been success. And within two weeks of the book coming out, I was getting emails and tweets from people about various ways that the book had already changed their perspective about 
about money. It's nice to be able to say things such as, I've been on CBS Sunday morning, and I've been on CNBC. You know, it's it's amazing to think that, but that goes away so fast. I mean, you do it in a day, you're on air for usually at most collectively, maybe five minutes, and then it's done, and then on to the next cycle. So to have something like a book and to have something that can continue to help people, yeah, that makes me feel a lot better. It is kind of the legacy factor, I guess. Something that's really interesting to me about what you're saying and about something that I have felt myself is that there are different points of success along the journey that we call life where it's like Mm -hmm. getting that book deal was probably you were like fuck yeah like I did that this is huge for me and then as you went through the process you were like okay yeah but on to the next thing like what can I push myself to achieve next what else is there to do and I feel that very strongly in my own life. I feel that strongly financially where it's like, okay, well, I got my emergency fund on lock. Well, now I want to really push my investments. Okay. I'm feeling really good about my investments. I have to like increase my annual salary. And then that can go forever and ever and ever, right? Like I could be earning a billion dollars and be like, one, 1.2 billion might be nice. (laughs) So it's kind of like points in time successes and this open-ended definition of success. I know that's how ambitious people think. I am very similar. I am not satisfied with a success for very long. So the one book came out and in the middle of writing the first, I knew I wanted to have more than one. You know, I immediately started to think, well, like anyone could probably get one, but not anyone could get two. And just sort of going down that rabbit hole in terms of pushing myself. I admire and I've always been a bit jealous of people who can just live a very simple existence in which they are not constantly feeling pushed to always having to be bettering themselves. And by bettering, I mean, outdoing the title, outdoing, you know, the next race, chasing the next goal. I would love to be able to turn my brain off and power down. And I think maybe I could rewire myself to think that way. But right now, I guess their version of life is almost Buddhist. And I am too capitalist at the moment to think that way. And it's hard for me to make the transition. Like it would be nice to be comfortable in the here and now and satisfied with what I have, but I'm constantly focused on chasing the next thing, which is not always the best for your mental health. Oh no, I think a lot of people would say it's unhealthy. (laughs) But Yep, probably. I I think I totally agree. I actually find it really, really interesting because on the one hand I'm very drawn to that lifestyle where it's sort of like like I joke all the time about wanting to move to a cabin somewhere in Wisconsin and just kind of like drop out of life and just have my garden and live my best life quietly. But I also know that I have always been hyper competitive. I mean, I don't play games with certain people because I'm like, we will get into a fight. I do have a question about success in other ladies, which is that sometimes I feel as a woman, my success is other women's success and my failure is other women's failure. Where it's like, if I'm bad with money, it's becomes, it doesn't become Kara's bad with money, it becomes women are bad with money. And so I carry this kind of like gender burden and I'm curious if you feel any of that. Oh, for sure. And it's unfair of anyone to put that on themselves, but at the same time, I think everybody does, whether it's gender or race you don't want to embody the stereotype that you know is thrown out against whatever it is that you are. Here I am trying to not just be in this space, but succeed and to reach this audience as well as a female audience, as well as a gender non-conforming audience, just anyone who's interested in money. How do I do that? And because of our society, male is kind of the default, right? So we Mm -hmm. women tend to think, okay, well, yeah, I'll keep my face off of it or I'll write under anonymous or a pseudonym. You know, the famous story J.K. Rowling was told, well, rather than put your first feminine name on here, let's go with your initials because that'll appeal to boy readers instead of turning them off. Mm -hmm. And you followed that pattern and you've seen success with that. And that's super exciting. But it is also kind of a bummer to be like, and this is an oppression that I must bear simply because I am not male. You know, and my name being Aaron didn't hurt. You know, most men don't spell it the way I do, but it's still technically an androgynous name in a lot of ways, especially if somebody hears it, they don't immediately know that I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. And one time an article that I wrote was getting dragged on Reddit. I forget which one and for why, but I have a fun ability to be able to read trolls and like not get super incensed a lot of the time, unless it's a sexist comment. And 
somebody was complaining about something and then he goes and this is me assuming it's a he he goes you know i don't normally like broke millennial but he does raise a good point here mm. <laughs> and i just sat at the computer i was like yes <laughs> it's been achieved <laughs> no one knows <laughs> and then the next commenter was it's a girl dumbass i mean at the end of the day you are a woman and things that happen to bum women out or <laughs> oppress women or whatever it is are going to affect your life and it's okay to say that. Who are some women that you think of as successful? Someone like a Meryl Streep or somebody like Sally Krawcheck, somebody with name recognition who has made it in a male-dominated field is where honestly my brain automatically goes. But I also think of a lot of my female friends who are just kicking ass. Like I'm so ex inspired by the group of women with whom I have the fortune to be surrounded by and the primarily millennial women, but not strictly all, who are really just figuring out how to hack life into what they want it to be. It's also inspiring to see how many people are choosing a lifestyle that is outside of the very traditional box. And I'm very inspired every time I see somebody make an alternative life choice, it's going to be slightly harder because I feel like they're paving the way for the next generation. Kara, you're a business owner. Tanya, you're a business owner. Woo, go us. And though we are badass business owners who are out here making hilarious podcasts and super engrossing blogs, parts of the job are not as glamorous. Like creating invoices, tracking payments, or making sure that people actually pay us for our hard work. Fortunately, FreshBooks makes all of that stuff easy. FreshBooks is the cloud accounting software that's changing the world for freelancers, small business owners, and everyone in the gig economy, giving us more time to focus on what we really care about. Like crushing the patriarchy. I've spent a 15-year career as a W-2 employee and have never actually had to do my own accounting or send an invoice to get paid. It's intimidating, but FreshBooks makes it completely unscary. I am both happy and ashamed to say that for over a year, I mixed and matched services to do my accounting, and it took so much time. FreshBooks is literally giving me back my time. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to the Fairer Sense listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash TFC and enter the Fairer Sense in the How Did You Hear About Us section. I had a conversation with my friend and colleague, Meg Sather, who is a fantastic human being, a super successful account lead at my soon-to-be former agency, and just someone who I really, really admire. She's also in a same-sex marriage with a wonderful wife named Jen, who I adore, and they have two incredible children. And so we're going to talk all about that, both her definition of success and how some of the dynamics of being in a marriage with another woman help kind of let them drop some of those gender roles and also complicate some things. You know, in a lot of ways, being in a same sex couple or a same gendered relationship, we do get the opportunity to throw everything out the window. And, you know, like on the most basic level, we get to decide who pays the bills and who does the laundry and who vacuums the floor, right? It's not going outside of a norm for us to say that a woman might do the finances and a man might do the cooking, for example. So that that is wonderful. And, and my wife is tremendous at being a great partner. And we've really, you know, we've been together for 15 years and so have really had the opportunity to, to throw lots of the gendered norms out the window and organize our lives in a way that really suits us best. It is interesting that since we had our kids and my wife carried them, so I am the non-gestational parent or NGP, she might be the primary parent but I am also a mom, right? And so one of my greatest struggles in parenthood that is sort of paired with the fact that I am the primary earner in our family, and especially since we've had our kids, Jen has really dialed back her work, though she is 
very successful on her own, even working like at a quarter time or less now. But one of our one of our primary challenges has been that I really do hold mom expectations for myself. And that is not to to disparage any man or any father at all. But I was raised Mormon and I'm over 40 now. And what I learned 40 years ago as I was growing up girl was about nurturing and caring and kind of owning the mental load that comes with parenthood. And for me to be in the position where I'm the one who works outside the home, I'm the primary earner in our family, but I also have the expectation for myself of wanting to prioritize my kids and my family and spend time with them and be home as much as possible and share that mental load. It has been a real challenge and probably the hardest thing about parenthood and parenthood and career in the last four plus years since my kids came along. So talking with other couples, we've got a lot of couples now who have kids roughly, at least one kid roughly around the same age. And I think that I see them struggling with those gendered norms. Like I think anyone who's a parent, or especially anyone who's a mom has been in a circle where like you're starting to complain about how your husband comes home from work and he's so tired and he just wants some alone time. And you're like, but I've been with the kids all day long and I'm just as tired. The struggle is real. And for me, holding myself to my mom expectations and trying to figure out how to balance that within continued growth and success in my career has just been hard. It definitely sounds hard. And I think we've talked on The Fairer Sense before about the first wave feminism kind of idea of having it all, of being amazingly unstoppable at work and crushing it in your personal life and at home and how unrealistic and unfair that can be, or at least it can be unrealistic and unfair if you let others define what having it all means. But it's interesting hearing you talk because it strikes me that it feels like you do put that pressure on yourself and, and not that you shouldn't because it sounds like you have very good reasons for all of it, but it does sound like just a really high standard to live up to, to be really incredible at home. But also I work with you. I know how amazing you are at the office as well and outside of the office. I know you're still working a lot. So that's less a question and more just a comment. <laughs> It's true, though. My expectations for myself didn't change when I became a parent. For me, welcome to parenthood, where you might be trying your very best across everything you do, and you never feel like you're doing well at anything. It's kind of a new standard for, for me, because I have high expectations of myself across everything. I just have a new standard for what it looks like. Sometimes I might not do exactly as well as I want to do on everything. And it's just a new standard, and it has to be okay. It's not to say that I wouldn't do well at work or wouldn't do well at home or I can only do well at one or the other. It just looks different. It's interesting what you said that you feel like you're always failing in some way. And that strikes me as just a really hard way to live and to go through your day every day. And do you think about that? Like, do you ever think about redefining your vision of success or just to put it more bluntly, like lowering the bar or taking it a little easier on yourself to make it so that you aren't always feeling like you're failing? I have spent the last three or four years trying to figure out what a new definition of success is so that I don't feel like I'm constantly letting someone or myself down. Absolutely. I think at some point, Two years ago, around the holidays and over New Year's, like my New Year's resolution was, how can I kind of do an inventory across professional and personal life and figure out what matters most so I can prioritize that? And if I can to do well at those things, then it's okay for me not to do as well at the other things. And it's a journey, right? So I think about it a lot. I work on it really actively. It strikes me that we just don't talk enough about how things will take a big adjustment. And maybe you guys got that wisdom from other friends when you were preparing to have your first child. But that's one of those things to me that like, I think all women could benefit from is just more conversation to let us know that, hey, like this is going to take some adjusting and there are going to be a lot of complicated feelings that come up out of it. And like, that's OK. That's part of the process. I wish more that that was in our narrative. I could not agree more. One of the things that we as women do not do enough is be honest with each other about the challenges. And I joke about how if you talk to me about parenthood, it makes you never want to have kids. I could not love my kids more, right? I absolutely, I don't regret having them. They are the bright, shiny lights in my life. It's also really, really hard. Parenthood is hard. Being a professional, being a mom, being a woman in the workplace with kids is really, really difficult. 
I talk about how difficult it is and it hits a chord with some people and especially women in a way that is a little bit surprising to me and people who don't want to kind of acknowledge that part. So it is a surprise. And I think we would do well for ourselves as women and just really everybody if we acknowledge the challenges that come with career and profession and parenthood and relationships and all those other things, because then we can address it in more real ways and have a deeper understanding about kind of the reality of things and how to support each other with it. We carry around so much guilt and feelings of failure and all these things because our own experiences don't match what the quote unquote right way to do things might be. And I'm completely convinced that no one ever achieves the right way. <laughs> or like, <laughs> Of course not. Of course. How could you? There's no right way. Yeah. It's interesting. Like I think that women get judged differently also if we are honest, because it sounds like we're being Debbie Downers. Like people focus on the negative part about what we're saying. And I think we feel this need to be positive and focus on the positive, be optimistic. And then that kind of to your point, like then that becomes what we're sharing instead of the challenges. But It's for good reason because we feel like people judge us if we do try to give both ends of it. And to me, I would just love to see that be more welcome in the conversation to be able to go like, like exactly how you talk about it. Like you couldn't love your kids more. You're totally glad you guys had them, but it comes with a lot of challenges and it's really, really hard. That feels like such an obvious way to be able to talk about it, but it's just not the norm. It's not the norm, but it is reality, right? And I, yes, I could not agree with you more. In fact, I think if there's one thing that I could tell women who are having kids these days is like, it's okay to be realistic about your experience. No mom experiences things in the same way. No woman man, husband, father, any, none of us experiences things in the same way. So let's be real with each other and let's figure out ways that we can help to kind of reclaim the narrative around women and around moms and around women, professional women in the workplace. If we could kind of reclaim that narrative, then I think it's just life will just be better for all of us. It's funny because I, when you were talking about the Debbie Downer thing, I thought about the fact just right now, this moment in time, all of a sudden people are realizing that it's actually not okay for a man to say to a woman, hey, smile, you've got such a pretty face. Well, I want to see you smile. But it's exactly the same thing as the expectation that when someone says, how do you do it all? Your answer to that is, my kids and my family are just wonderful and blah, blah, blah. The problem, we don't do it all. None of us can do it all. Not men, not women, not anybody. And so the same idea, if we can now understand that it's not okay for for a man to tell a woman to smile, it's also not okay for us in society to expect all women to answer the question, how are you with, I'm great, everything's wonderful. It's this interesting thing where the patriarchal society is telling us to smile and telling us to be positive. So then we do that, but we've all internalized that ourselves as well. So that if somebody starts with kind of the challenge side of things, I do think that women will often judge and do the, you know, hey, stop being such a Debbie Downer. Or you're such a pessimist or, you know, you're not being positive like you're supposed to be. And it ultimately does all of us a big disservice. And that's to me, one of the things that we have to stop internalizing. We have to recognize like, hey, this idea that we're supposed to say everything's great all the time is harming us, it's also not fully true. And we will all do better together if we can drop this crap and actually just be honest with each other. Amen, sister. I'm on board. (laughs) Sign me up. If I were talking with Jen right now, what do you think she would say about your definition of success or about her definition of success for you? And do you think that she thinks you hold yourself to too high a standard or do you think it feels just right to her? It's almost like you're channeling conversations we've had in the last week (laughs) or two, because we've just come back from a nice vacation where we actually got some time together. Jen would say that I hold myself to much too high a standard and that it's okay for me to ease up, especially on the home side, because that's where her focus is and 100% agree, right? And I'm trying to do that in part because that's where she's chosen her focus. And that's frankly, you know, it's where she's focusing now and where she is just really brilliant at what she's doing. But I am who I am. And I still, you know, I have to trust and honor myself to also know that there are things that I want. I, you know, I have 14 to 18 
years with my children in my home, God willing. And I want, you know, I've made the commitment to making them great human beings. And I want to be able to spend more time and more energy and more of the mental load on them than I do on myself or on my work right now. One of the things that I love about your answer there is that the pressure you're putting on yourself to have the time at home and to be present for things is it feels like a bit less about your socialization and the pressure that society puts on you. And it's more just like I say this in the best possible way, but it's more the selfish aspect of like you have this limited window of time with the kids and you don't want to miss it. And that to me feels like the right reason to put the pressure on yourself. You know what I mean? Like it's for you and that's good. And like you should own that. Like good for you. No, it is. Thank you. It is for me. I'm choosing it. Like I could make a lot of different choices and they would be okay too. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that because I am choosing that. really strikes me about the idea of success is how it's kind of never ending, which I talked about before. But earlier I was talking about this podcast with a friend and she asked me, what are you doing with the podcast? Like, what's your goal for it? And obviously our goal is to take over the world. Like that should be very clear. (laughs) (laughs) But in like a non-authoritarian way. (laughs) (laughs) Right. We're not dictators. We're like super cool global rulers. (laughs) Um, Global empowerers? I don't know. (laughs) We'll play around with that. We'll play around with that. But (laughs) I mean, we do have goals for this podcast and I do want it to be successful in a variety of ways. But it also struck me, can we do something without needing it to be, you know, air quotes, successful anymore? Or does everything have to have an end point? Does it have to have a goal or can you just create to create? Can you just do something because you enjoy it? I feel like I run into this all the time. People kind of want to know who you are, what you're doing, where are you trying to go? What are you doing to get there? Are you using this? Are you doing that? Have you spoken to such and such? Which I think is heightened because I'm an entrepreneur, but I kind of want to back away from that in my personal life and just do stuff to do stuff and be a person who creates without needing to succeed. Yeah. Or thinking about what success actually means. Like This is something that I've thought about a lot with regard to this podcast and the next one that Mark and I have planned that we're going to launch in the winter called Adventures in Early Retirement. And it's interesting because with the two, I really do think success feels pretty different. Like with this one, the reality is for us, having reached financial independence, we don't technically need this to make money. It's nice that nice sponsors like FreshBooks are helping us at least cover our expenses and make a little more than that. But fundamentally, I'm respectful that you, Kara, are in a different place in your financial journey. And like, I don't want to take a whole bunch of your time because as we are definitely seeing, podcast production is super time consuming. And knowing what limited time you have and all the different ways that you're hustling so hard, I wouldn't want to oblige you to something that takes all this time and isn't ultimately going to pay off in some way financially. So I think that's been something that I've been thinking about for this podcast, maybe in some ways more on your behalf than on my own. But certainly I also think given the uncertainty of jumping into early retirement, and even though we feel really good about our finances, we also just like are kind of terrified because this is a big deal and not something we've done before. And so the thought of a little extra income is great. But then I think with the other podcast, it's just basically like, is it fun? Does it feel worth doing? Are we proud of what we're putting out there? That's ultimately what success is and not like how many downloads it gets or what sponsors are interested metrics in so many parts of our lives, they've become the norm, right? We can look up the data on so many things. And that gets tied in, I think, very closely with success. You know, how many clients did you sign? How much money have you earned? What is the data? And I have been trying to encourage myself to back away from that a little bit. It's hard. And I'm just as (laughs) into the demographics and the data as the next person. And it is nice to see good numbers, but it's also important, I think, not to, for me to get my sense of self-worth caught up in that. And also my sense of success. I think doing a good job, which we strive to do on this podcast, I strive to do in lots of areas of my life, is itself success. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. Gosh. I'm not going to lie. Not all the time. Sometimes. <laughs> For sure. And like, I don't think that any of this stuff is so cut and dried. Like it, this idea that you're either successful or not, like, I, I mean, I sort of wonder, like, is there anyone who's not delusional, who's ever in the history of humankind felt like they were just completely successful? 
in the conversation with Megan, hearing her talk about parenting, feeling at all times like she's failing a little bit, like I think we all carry some version of that and probably parenthood magnifies that. But I think we are all our own harshest critics in some ways. And so I think for me, a mission that I have in early retirement is to really try to redefine success because now that I'm stepping away from a traditional career, I'm losing all the signifiers of traditional success. And I, I'm not going to lie, like I think that's going to be a struggle for me because especially as a person who really loves gold stars, like I did win a blog award this year, but like I don't want to feel like I have to win a blog award to feel like I'm succeeding in my life. You know what I mean? And like when you're just living your life and you're not working and you're not doing a lot of the stuff that is like quote unquote normal, there are no feedback loops for that kind of stuff. And there are no metrics to tell you if you're successful and you just have to decide totally for yourself. So I think that's, that is the journey I'm about to embark on and I will report back on how it goes, but I expect it to kind of kick my ass a lot of the time. Yeah. You're taking the leap into the the great wide open and it is wild in many ways. And I think this definition of success is definitely one of them. I think moving forward in my life for me, success definitely is beginning much more so to be tied up with less tangible things. I'm definitely still very ambitious in many ways. There are a lot of things I want to do with my career and my time, but especially of late, I've been thinking a lot about wanting to find stillness in my life in many ways and tranquility and I hate to use this word, but peace. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of success is making healthy choices for myself that go beyond healthy financial choices. And that it's a little weird. It's a little weird to be doing that. It's more and more so something that feels really right for me. So I don't really have like a concrete definition of success for myself right now. I do have goals that I'm setting for myself, but it's a nebulous thing and I want it to be very holistic for me. I appreciate that so much. And that's something that I wish I had realized earlier in life was so important because I do think you can look at success in so many different ways. Like if you just think of it as like a data dashboard, you know, you you might be doing really well on the money front, but really poorly on the taking care of yourself front. Like I will say the times in my life when I have earned the most money and been quote unquote the most successful, um, you know, had the most impressive title and had the most impressive sounding clients. Like those were the times when I was eating like shit, when I felt terrible when I wasn't sleeping enough, which, well, that's kind of a lifelong problem, but Mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily in a good place in my marriage. And yet like on the surface in just a career sense, you would have go like, you would have gone like, oh, she's really successful. That's cool. She got promoted at early ages. And like, that's to me sort of the problem with the narrative is that we do tend to focus more on some things than others. Like, I think it's a pretty evolved person who would say about someone else, like, wow, that person's so successful. They just seem so happy and grounded and well-rested and like they're taking great care of themselves. You know, like we don't tend to do that. We tend to talk in terms of accolades or in terms of job prestige or money or social status. And that's the stuff that ultimately like we have all heard tons of stories like that of people who've achieved that stuff but have been miserable. Like that's something that I hope we'll keep talking about is how we can redefine that idea of success to focus on meaning and personal happiness and the more holistic vision, as you said. Completely. like we said a lot, (laughs) success is very personal. And I'm really curious to hear what y'all think of success. So here are a couple questions that if you have some time, please feel free to write us and tell us your stories and tell us your answers. But you know, what is success for you? How has it changed in your life? How do you welcome other people into your success? That's something we didn't talk too much about, but I think a lot about, especially as an entrepreneur with a non-entrepreneurial partner. How do I bring T-Bone along for this ride? Mm-hmm. How do I celebrate and share the ups and downs with him and with friends? So I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear from y'all. Yeah. And I think for me, it's not just how has your vision of success changed, but I'd love to hear if anybody's had kind of a personal evolution like I have of realizing that it's the more meaning-filled side of things that's more important. And like, frankly, also it might just be fun. It might just be like, how much are you enjoying your life day to day? It doesn't all have to be super heavy and filled with like the big karmic stuff, but that realization. And then 
Additionally, anybody out there, I'd love, you know, this would just make me personally feel better if there are others who've had that realization, but then also know that that's a big struggle. Because I think for those of us who really love gold stars, it's a really hard thing to go like, okay, intellectually, I know I need to let go of the traditional definitions of success because they are ultimately not making me any happier. But like, I am so wired at this point, whether it's through socialization or something else to crave that. And so learning to let that go and to embrace something else is definitely going to be a, a journey. So you can definitely let us know at any of our places. You can tweet at us at Fairer Sense. You can email us at Fairer Sense at Gmail, or you can leave a comment on the show notes page at thefairersense.com. And as always, you can find us anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. Please subscribe if you like what you're hearing and leave us a review. We love to hear from y'all. Anything you have to say, we want to hear from you. All right. Well, Kara, so nice as always to chat with you and especially about a big subject like this one. I loved this chat. This was so great. I love all our chats. Who am I kidding? (laughs) I feel like every time I'm like, yes, this was so enjoyable. (laughs) And I will say one of the things I love, like I obviously love chatting with you, but like the nice tweets that we get and notes we get after, like it really does feel like it's not just us here. Like I feel like we're we're speaking on behalf of our friends and others who are listening and to all of y'all out there right now with headphones in or listening on your speaker in your kitchen or car or wherever you're listening. Like just know how much we appreciate you guys and we love hearing from you so that it helps to broaden this conversation. And we've gotten tons of great ideas for shows or for ways that we can improve the episodes and we really love all of that. So keep it coming and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, listeners. Everybody stay rad. Stay rad. The Fairer Sense is produced by me, Tanya Hester, and the beautiful, brilliant, hilarious Kara Perez, editing by me. Our theme music is by The Insider, and our ad music is by Keith McLeod, with additional music from The Mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder, Spinning Merkaba, The Insider, BOPD, Jazar, Baby59, Boxcat Games, and Broke for Free. You can always find me at ournextlife.com and Kara at bravelygo.co. 